Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and today we're going to be taking a look at MSI's budget offering on the X570 chipset, the X570-A Pro. Keep watching to find out more. So today we're going to be taking a look at the budget end of the X570 range. Now at the moment, this particular model, the MSI X570-A Pro, is the cheapest X570 motherboard you can buy on the market, at least in the UK anyway. I will put affiliate links in the description below so you can check out local pricing, but I'm pretty sure wherever you look, this one is gonna be pretty much at the bottom end of the market. And there's various reasons for that, but there's also reasons why you should definitely consider it. Now, as you know, on Mike's Unboxing, we do like to favor the budget oriented builds, and this comes in at a perfect price. At the moment, this price, around about the £140 mark, as of April 2020, puts it just slightly dearer than some of the higher end offerings on the B450 chipset range, but you get pretty much most of the features, plus you get the Gen 4 support for PCI Express. So lots of features, lots of things going for it. You've probably seen reviews already where this board actually does suffer quite badly with its VRM cooling solution and the power of its VRMs for that matter. But rest assured, unless you're gonna be overclocking on liquid nitrogen, or just trying to push crazy clocks on your 3950X, this board is gonna be absolutely fine for pretty much all setups. Ideally, I would suggest, obviously, it is a relatively low-end board for the particular chipset, so the kind of perfect sweet spot is like your Ryzen 5 3600 and thereabouts, which this board makes a lot of sense for. So let's take a look at the packaging, and then we'll go through the unboxing process, and then we'll give you a tour of the board, and then my final thoughts at the end of the video. Okay, so to start with, very plain packaging, uh, pretty much the usual MSI deal. Says what it is, X570-A Pro. It's got support for AMD Ryzen processors. It also supports, obviously, the latest 3000 series, which this chipset was designed for. As it says on the box, it supports PCI Express Gen 4.0 and has AMD Store MI technology built in. Moving around to the side of the box, it goes into a little bit of detail of the supported or unsupported processors. So this doesn't support the A-series Athlon processors, neither does it support the Athlons with Radeon Vega graphics. But for all the other ones, like, like the 3000G, that kind of thing, the 3200s, no problem at all. So if you're using either a second or third gen Ryzen, even first gen Ryzen's are absolutely fine. Things like your 1700X, the Ryzen 5 1600 AF, absolutely perfect for this board. Moving around onto the back, it goes into some detail about the individual specifications. So again, one of the highlights of the chipset is the Gen 4 PCI Express and the M.2s. You've also got optimized for multi-GPU, so if you're using Crossfire, which I probably doubt you are, but potentially you could use that if you wanted to. It's got Audio Boost 4, and this has the Realtek ALC1220 chipset, which is a slightly uprated chipset from what we're used to seeing on some of these budget boards. So really good sound solution. This also supports DDR4 Boost, so it does take it a little bit higher than the rated specifications for DDR4, so you can get up to 4,400 megahertz on overclocks. So with all the uh, really inexpensive high megahertz RAM on the market at the moment, you can certainly take advantage of that. But if you're on a lower budget and you've maybe got some old DDR2133 lying around, you can still use it on here without any issues. It goes down to say more about Core Boost, which is a little bit of a mute point because of precision boost overclocking and also the situation with the VRMs. Potentially it's not quite as good as their make out on the box, but still perfectly functional. Just overclocking is something we really do need to be considerate of. One nice feature, which actually does stand out above the crowd, is for the heatsink for the chipset. Now the chipset heatsink actually does have a fan on it, which is the Frozer design, and actually supports zero fan as well. So if the fan doesn't need to spin because the chipset's nice and cool in your nicely air-cooled chassis, then the fan will actually stop, which is quite a rarity these days, as most X570 chipset based boards, the fans spin continually. So that is a nice feature. At the bottom here, it goes to give you an overview of the IO, which actually is pretty decent for the spec, but we'll take a closer look at that when we give you a tour of the board. Okay, so the unboxing process now, to get this straight out of the way, I picked this up from CCL in the UK, which is a pretty decent computer components supplier, manufacturer, distributor, etc. I did pick this up a little bit cheaper than the regular retail price because it was an open box model. And as it turns out, there's two things missing from this particular one, one of which is the installation manual and the other is the pair of SATA connectors. So obviously, if you're buying this brand new, you will get an installation manual and you'll get the SATA connectors. 
but I did get a, uh, a pretty drastic reduction from not having those included, so another great saving. So in the box, we get the motherboard, which we'll take a look at in a little while. We get the IO backplate, which as you can see has uh, been opened before. Again, this was an open box model. We get our MSI gaming leaflet, the MSI True Gaming Badge, a thank you for purchasing a MSI product, the MSI installation DVD with drivers, etc. We get a quick installation guide, information about the case standoff locations, and a pair of M.2 retaining screws. Okay, so let's take a tour of the board itself. So, starting off on the top left-hand corner, we've got our 8-pin and additional 4-pin power supply connectors for CPU additional power. Now, most people do ask the same thing, do I need the 4-pin as well? Easy answer is, realistically, no. The motherboard will deliver up to 300 watts of power through the 8-pin connector, so unless you're really overclocking on liquid nitrogen, which obviously we're not gonna be doing on this board, it's very unlikely you need that extra 4-pin connector. Although if you are using a slightly lower end power supply and you have that extra four pin connector, then feel free to use it, but it isn't required. Moving further across, we've got this heatsink at the top, which matches up nicely with the heatsink on this side. This is part of the problem that I see with this particular board is the heatsink itself is quite weighty and is quite large, but unfortunately doesn't have any real vents in it. So the surface area is limited. It's not particularly great for cooling. This is one of the things which I will be looking at and addressing hopefully in future videos. So if you want to see how that goes, click on the subscribe icon and the chime icon and you'll be notified of, of future video releases. But certainly I believe that to be one of the sort of problem areas. Again, with this board, the VRMs aren't great and they do underperform compared to some of the more expensive competition. But realistically, adding a 120 mil fan or having some decent airflow around this area, price of an extra fan is about 10 pounds Whereas the next board up with very good VRM quality is about an extra 50 to 60 pounds. So take that into consideration. Moving along at the top here, we've got a CPU fan header, which is a four pin. Now all of the CPU fan headers and also the regular fan headers all support auto sensing. So whether you're using a DC fan or a PWM fan or even a water pump, you can adjust those very easily both in the BIOS and also in the MSI Dragon software. Moving along, we've got a 12 volt RGB connector and next to that, we've got a three pin, five volt addressable RGB connector. So if you've got some kind of RGB stuff going on, nice and easy places to connect up there. On this far side, we've got a pump fan header. It is labeled again as pump fan, but you can change that and use it as pretty much any type of fan that you want in the BOSS and in the software. We've got four slots for DDR4 RAM. This supports up to 128 gigs of RAM, which uh, should be more than enough for now and a couple of years into the future. Over the four slots, you can install 32 gigs in each. Again, 128 gigs total. And like we said earlier, memory speeds supported actually from the lowly 1,866 megahertz right the way up to a whopping 4,400 megahertz in overclock mode. That may well change to higher frequencies as BIOS updates become available. Moving down, we've got our four debug LEDs. So if you're building a system and you're not booting for some reason, you can look at the debug LEDs and see where the issue is, whether it be motherboard, processor, graphics, RAM, etc. Those are really helpful, especially for novices or even for experienced system builders who are struggling to get the machine to post. Moving down, we've got a 24 pin power connector, which is uh, pretty much where we'd expect to see it. We've now got six SATA connectors, all supporting six gigabit per second. And also there is the first of our USB 3.0 front panel connectors. Moving across slightly, we've got our AM4 socket, which again, as we said, supports the majority of AMD processors. The very low end processors are not included in the BOSS and are not supported, but realistically, you wouldn't be pairing those sort of chips with this type of motherboard anyway. But for support as it stands at the moment, up to 3950X, this board will take all the current Ryzen's 3s, 5s, 7s, and 9s. Moving down, we've got our Ultra Gen 4 supporting PCI Express. So for your NVMe drives, or you can if you want to, you can install a SATA based M.2 drive in this selection here. There is a thumb screw already attached to the board. Whether or not yours will come attached already, I'm not too sure. Like I said, this is a open box model, so that may have been put in already. But these are nice and easy to do, and they're literally on thumb screw, so it makes installation really easy if you don't have a hex wrench. Moving down, we've got our Gen 4 PCI Express connector. Again, this will support backwards compatibility for PCI Express Gen 3, but if you've got a Gen 4 supported graphics card, theoretically, you can get more bandwidth through it. Moving down a little bit more, we've got the first of our PCI Express times one slots, and then we've got another times 16 slot, although it's wired electrically for times eight, and then there's another additional two PCI Express times one ports. 
Moving back across, we've got our MSI heatsink across the chipset, and there is a sticker on there to remove, so make sure you remove that before you actually try using the motherboard. And like I said, it's got this Frozer fan on there, which supports zero RPM, so if you do need it to be super quiet, it will be quiet under low loads. Saying that, even under full RPMs, the fan is known to be very, very quiet, and no louder than any of the other components or fans on the system. Moving down to the bottom of the board, we've got another one of our J Rainbow connectors, or to you and me, that is a five volt addressable RGB connector. There's also your front IO connectors, so hard drive activity, power button, reset, all those kinds of things can be plugged into there. There's also an additional USB 3.0 front panel connector. And next to that, we've got a USB 2 port and another USB 2 port. So you can add on an additional four USB 2 ports on the back of the case, should you have a case that supports it. Or maybe you've got like a card reader built into your case, you can plug those into there quite easily. Just above there, we've got some of our chassis intrusion connections and reset for the CMOS, that kind of thing. There's an additional PCI Express Gen 3 NVMe or SATA drive connection there. So again, if you want to add another M.2 style drive, you can do that from there. That is only Gen 3 maximum supported, whereas the top one is Gen 4. Next up, we've got our COM port connection, which probably you will never ever use. And then the weird thing which uh, we've got here is we've got four PWM style fan headers all in a row, which again, depending on your system setup, may be beneficial, it may not be. Personally, I would have liked to have seen maybe two down here and an additional one in this corner. That is the one downside that I can see of this board. There isn't a chassis fan connector over in this particular area. So if you've got a 120 mil fan at the rear, you are gonna have to run the cable down the motherboard and into this section, which again, Potentially could be problematic for some, but certainly not a deal breaker. Moving along, we've got our TPM port or trusted platform module. So if you're using one of those, you can plug it into this bottom section. Then next to that is another 12 volt RGB connector for normal RGB. And last one along the end there is our front audio connector, which is the HD audio. So to plug in your front panel connections, you can just plug it into there. All of the audio section is on a kind of separate layer to keep it isolated and to reduce noise and static as much as is possible. Moving around to the rear I.O. on the board, we've got a pretty decent setup here actually, especially considering this is what is effectively a budget X570 chipset. We've got our BIOS flashback button. Now this is absolutely brilliant. So if and when AMD release new processors, which aren't currently supported on your motherboard BIOS, you can quite easily put the BIOS onto a USB stick, put it into this bottom port, and press and hold the BIOS button and you can flash your BIOS to the current version. Again, this will add features such as increased memory support, reliability options, and a GSA updates as well. So we've got two USB 2.0 ports there, along with a combo PS2 port for keyboard or mouse. We've got an HDMI output there. So that is again, another slight downside. We don't have DVI or VGA on this board, although I think most people now would probably be using HDMI port. Shame not to see a display port on here. But again, X570 chipset is highly likely that you'll be using a graphics card. So the ports will be available on that. So we've got two USB 3.0 ports. Next up, we've got our USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A and Type C ports. Really nice to see a Type C port on this board. Next up, we've got our LAN port. So the LAN port supports gigabit internet speeds and 10100 should you want to use it. You've also got another pair of USB 3.1 ports. Moving down, we've got our audio connection. So we've got five audio ports on the 3.5 mil jack, which supports things like your headsets, microphones, all that kind of stuff. It can support up to 7.1 surround systems. And also you've got an optical out as well. So if you want to connect it to a home theater setup, you can do quite easily. So there we go. That is the MSI X570-A Pro. I've got to be honest with you, I'm really impressed with it. For the price, it does offer fantastic value for money. Yes, the VRMs are not the best and quite easily they possibly are the worst of the X570 chipsets. But realistically, what are you going to be using on this board? If you're going to be using a Ryzen 5 or even a moderate Ryzen 7, you've got no issues whatsoever. As you get into the realms of the Ryzen 9s, maybe you should be looking at a higher end board, especially if you're considering some hardcore overclocking. As we know, most of the Ryzen 3000 series, the overclocking doesn't always get much further than the precision boost overclocks anyway. So unless you're actually experienced and know how to squeeze all that performance out of the processor, do you really need those higher end boards? For me personally, no, I'm gonna be pairing this with either a Ryzen 7 1700X or maybe a Ryzen 5 3600. 
and for that it's going to be absolutely fine even if i put a ryzen 9 3950x in there it's going to cope with it absolutely fine with just precision boost overclocking generally the issue with this in a lot of the reviews is where they've used it on an open test bench with zero airflow just using the board as is with a traditional airflow this board is going to be absolutely fine again we possibly will be taking a look at the VRM setup to see if we can increase the performance of the actual heat sinks. Although, do you really need to? Is overclocking on a lower end board that important to you? Most people I think who will be buying this board are gonna be going more for the flexibility of your PCI Express Gen 4, your increased memory speeds, and also the ability to use the latest and greatest Ryzen processors without having to flash the BIOS. So let me know what you think of this board in the comment section below. Personally, I think it's a winner, but we will be installing this into a system soon and doing some further investigation on how it actually performs. And hopefully it does pretty good. So I've been Mike, this is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.